shifting our mindsets is hard. So I'd like to take a couple of minutes and just think about why is it difficult? Why is it hard to shift our thinking? With the help of another optical illusion. Uh, have you guys seen this one before? Yeah? So when people present this one, they usually say, can you see an old lady and can you see a young lady? So let's start there. Who can see a young lady? Okay, most of us, great. Who can see an old lady? Who can see both? Okay, good, good, good. And if you're struggling at all, if like you're wondering where they are, uh, the young lady is looking off into the distance and she has her, there she is, she has her ear is here, she's looking off in that direction. This is her jaw, this is her choker, there's her neck, does that make sense? And then the old lady, well actually this is her eye, this is her nose, this, what was the choker now becomes a mouth, and then obviously that's a chin. Does that make sense? So my question though isn't can you see an old lady and a young lady, my question is a bit different. My question is, can you see both an old lady and a young lady at exactly the same time? Not roughly the same time, not approximately the same time, but at exactly the same time, can you see both an old lady and a young lady? And I'm gonna suggest, I'm gonna suggest to you that you can't, because it's an optical illusion after all, right? And the reason we can't is because if only for a second, if only for a nanosecond, if we want to see the young lady and we're seeing the old lady, if just for a nanosecond we have to just flick our perspective and we have to go, okay, now I'll see a young lady. And the other way around, if I'm seeing the young lady and I want to see the old lady, I have to flick my perspective and see the old lady. Another way of saying this is if I want to see something new, I have to let go of what I think I already know. If I want to see something new, I have to let go of what I think I already know. And that is the challenge of expanding our thinking. Because most of us don't think that our worldview is one way of looking at the world. Most of us think our worldview is the way of looking at the world. It's the best way of looking at the world. It's the most efficient way of looking at the world. It's the most obvious way of looking at the world. And for us, that's true, because like I said, our worldview is based on everything that we've experienced, so it makes sense that we would go, okay, actually, this worldview, it really is the best way of looking at the world. And if we feel that our worldview is the best way of looking at the world, then why would we ever want to expand our thinking? There's no need. And that lack of need, if you like, is the reason why it becomes very, very difficult to shift our thinking. There's a Japanese character, and it's often translated as a beginner's mind, which is true. Sometimes it's translated as a beginner's heart, which is also true. But this character means more than both of those things. As a matter of fact, it's so hard to translate into English that I just go with the Japanese word, which is shoshin. And shoshin means many, many things in English. It means having a willingness to explore something with fresh eyes. It means being humble in the way that we express ourselves because we know that there are other ways of seeing things and other ways of doing things. If you've ever looked out onto a really beautiful sunset and you saw that sunset and you really noticed how the colors are filling the sky and how it's tinging the sky and the clouds and how the colors are changing as they radiate away from the sun and you're just sitting there in that moment appreciating this sunset without thinking about the hundreds of other sunsets that you've ever looked at. You're just looking at this one. If you've ever done that, then you've experienced Shoshin. It's the ability to just go, I'm here and I see this. And whatever comes out of that is whatever comes out of that. And then the opposite of Shoshin 
is this thing I call the expert mind. The expert mind emerges when I've been in, in perhaps a role for a very long time. I've been in a sector for a very long time. Perhaps I've been senior for a long time. Perhaps in my personal life, I've just been doing things for a long time. And because I've been doing it for a long time, I start to think that I know quite a lot about it. I start to think that not only do I know a whole bunch of things that I can draw on, but I also can use the stuff that I've drawn on to predict what is going to happen in the future, to handle problems that come up now based on what I've done before. Sometimes the expert mind emerges because let's say we're senior and we're getting paid to be senior. I have a title that says I'm senior. So I feel like I should probably know the answers to things. But let me give you an example of how the expert mind can trip us up. Do you guys have um, a smartphone? Because if you do, you owe that to a man called Johannes Vanenin. Because Johannes Vanenin invented the smartphone five years before Steve Jobs unveiled the iPhone at Macworld. And Johannes Vanenin called his smartphone my device. And he took his my device to Nokia, who was the biggest cell phone company in the world at the time. And he said to them, could I have some help in the manufacture and the distribution of this phone? And they said, no. And they gave him several reasons for why they said no. And one of them was they said, we know that touchscreens will never catch on because people don't like having their fingerprints on their phones. <laughs> and it isn't just Nokia. That happened with Western Union. That's happened with Kodak. And it doesn't just happen in corporations. It happens in institutions when there's a certain way that we think things should be done. It happens in our personal lives when we're certain of a certain track. And then there's the opposite to that. So just a small example of Shoshin. Einstein, before he's famous, but he's still, before he's the Einstein that we know now, but still kind of famous, is sitting in a publishing house in Switzerland. And in that publishing house, he's in a cafe having lunch. And not very far from him, there's a bunch of printers trying to figure out a printing problem. And they can't figure it out. They're struggling. They're having a hard time. And they're trying to figure out this thing, and they can't figure it out. And somebody says, look, Einstein's over there. Why don't we ask him? And the others are like, well, but you know, yeah, fine, OK, we can't figure it out. So begrudgingly, they go and they say to him, you, know, we probably, you, know, like, we, you probably won't know the answer to this. But anyway, here, what do you think? So he, he takes the problem. He looks at the problem, he thinks about the problem, he hands it back to them and he says, have you tried this? And of course he's right. And they say to him, how could you possibly have known when you're not a printer? And he says, well, it's because I'm not a printer. You see, it's kind of easy actually to hold Shoshin when we really don't know. Then we really do ask simple questions, sometimes profound questions, because we don't know what we don't know. But it's much harder to hold Shoshin when we do know, when we do have skills and experience.